God really spoke to you through that time of worship. Thanks for singing this morning. It was great to hear the voices. Thanks, Dave, for leading the worship team as we praise an awesome God. Continuing on in my series in the book of Colossians that we're calling Christ Our Life. And so I'd love to have you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, please. Um, for those of you who I've never had a chance to meet, my name is John Louder. I'm the lead pastor here at Frontline Bible Church. And uh, it is my pleasure, my privilege, to come up and be able to preach the word and uh, to be able to do this and be a part of a church like Frontline. So thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> As you're turning to, uh, to there, I want to tell you a little story. Uh, there was a man by the name of Alexander, and he was asked to build something for a city. Um, and he was asked, there was, they were having an international exposition. And so they were putting this exposition together. They came to him and they said, would you be willing to build some sort of a, of a large display for this? And he says, yes, I'd be happy to do that. I have just the right idea in mind of what I want to do. So sure enough, he sets to work and he begins to build and it's getting bigger and bigger. And the people who are watching this thing are saying this thing is getting uglier and uglier. And he keeps building and building and finally the people of the city were so upset with his monstrosity, they called it, that as soon as the exposition was over, they said, you need to tear this thing down. Well, Alexander, he kind of liked his thing, and he thought that this thing wasn't going to be an eyesore someday, that he thought that it would actually be something that people would want to see, and so he fought, and he fought. Finally, he won the right to be able to keep his monument, and the people had to just lump it. Eventually, people began to like it. In fact, to this day, it is something that people will travel the world over to go see. You see, Alexander's last name was Eiffel. Alexander Eiffel, and he built a tower, the Eiffel Tower. But you see, at the time, the people didn't like it. They thought, ugh, what use is this? Get rid of this thing. It's ugly. It's dumb. It doesn't make any difference for us. And sure enough, he saw greatness where others didn't see it. And really, that's really what we're coming to when it comes to our series on, in the book of Colossians. What we're, showing, what we're shown here throughout the book of Colossians, Colossians is Paul is saying what you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Period. You need Christ. And others are looking around and going, yeah, okay, Christ, yes, he's important, I, I get it. I mean, I, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, I get it, I get it. Yep, I believed, him from, believed in him for salvation. But is he really that important? And Paul keeps coming back and he's saying, no, it's really important that we keep the focus on Christ. Are you sure that we don't need all this other stuff in there? Are you sure we don't need a bunch of rules in there? Because, man, it seems like from... Ages past, we've, the way you've dealt with God is through a bunch of rules. You need Christ. Are you sure we don't need to kind of like make things hard for our body? Because, man, my body gets me into a whole lot of trouble. Are you sure we don't need to practice some, some things that are going to really... No, you need Christ. You need Christ. Let me keep, bring it back to you. You need Christ. And when we come back to this, that's what Paul was like a battering ram throughout the entire book of Colossians. Christ is our life. And I hope that as we go through the series, you're going to begin to see this. And maybe that same battering ram that, that Paul is doing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is going to break through the walls and the traditions and all the things that you hold on to to say, this is how I'm close to God. This is how I get close to God. I get close to God by X, Y, Z. And the answer is always, you get close to God through Jesus Christ. And that's what I hope we get because I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel like I don't do real good at this thing called the Christian life. Yeah, I, I, I was reading this past, what, past week. There was a book that I'm reading. It's called The Normal Christian Life. How many of you would like to be normal? Yeah, reading through this book, I'm realizing my life is not real normal. And in throughout this book, this guy by the name of Watchman Nee. He writes in here and he talks about how 
The Christian life is not meant to be a struggle. I don't know about you, but this is what I felt like many times. If only I were stronger, I could overcome. What is it for you? If only I were stronger, I could beat my temper. If only I were stronger, I I could stop worrying so much. If if only I were stronger, I, I, I wouldn't have such a lust problem. If only I were stronger, man, I could tell that addiction goodbye. If only I were stronger. If only I were stronger, man, I wouldn't struggle with anger and lack of patience. Fill in the blank. Maybe this past week, did you feel that way? You're thinking to yourself, man, I've got to go to church on Sunday. Oh boy, I'm going to go to church on Sunday and I'm going to be reminded of all the ways that I'm failing at this thing. And I want to tell you this morning, there's really good news. If you feel like you're failing at the Christian life, God is saying, good. You're getting to be just where I want you. Because I will tell you, the answer comes back to you and I need Jesus Christ. And so as we begin to talk through this, I wanna, we're going to look at our series, our section here in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Last week we looked at the introduction of Colossians and the stuff that Paul's dealing with here as he writes to these people. Remember, he had never even met these people. These people, he had, um, he had worked in this place called, uh, a town called Ephesus. It was a city. And he had trained up some people. And these people in Ephesus said, man, these people in Colossae, which is a real town in modern day Turkey. It was a real town there, real city. He says, man, these people in Colossae, they need to hear about Jesus too. So you, this guy by the name of Epaphras goes over to this town in Colossae, which is about 100 miles away. And he goes over and he tells them about Jesus. And they begin to understand who Jesus is. And things are going good, but then there were people that came into the church that started messing them up. And they started getting all confused. They started thinking, I have to do this, i got to practice that, I can't say this, I can't be here, I can't do all these things, i got to do all these things, because that's the way that I become complete in Christ. And Paul keeps coming back saying, no, Jesus Christ is all you need. And that's what we're getting at, I think, even in our churches today. It's amazing as I look around and I hear good preachers who are out there. And it sounds oftentimes like self-help religion. They preach Jesus Christ, which is great. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. You need to accept Him for the salvation of your sins. Uh, to save you from your sins because we're all sinners and we all stand in need of a Savior. But it's almost like we, we say, okay, I can't do anything to get saved, but now that I am saved, whoo, man, i got to get to work. And i got to keep trying, i got to keep trying, i got to keep trying. And the answer comes back, do you know what Jesus wants to do in you? And so in this section, I think we're going to see, Paul's going to be praying here. He's, his prayer right here in verse 9 to verse 14 You can see his prayer actually started in verse 3, but we covered part of that last week through verse 8. Now we're coming into 9. Because the title of my message this morning, I don't always talk about this, but the title of my message this morning is this. God, help us know this. God, help us know this. This will change your life. This will change our church. This will change the world if we as the church begin to understand what we have in Jesus Christ. And that's why I said that it's, it's almost like Paul was saying these very words. God, help them know this. And he's saying the very same thing for us. God, help them know this. Help us know this. And so in verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's our passage this morning. Because it is Paul's prayer. He's saying, God, here's what we need. And really it comes down to this. 
God, help us experience all you have for us in Christ. Now, I will be perfectly honest here. You know, when I do my preaching class, when I teach guys how to preach, when I go through this, I tell them, your prop should be how many words, guys, who have gone through this? Four words. That's what you want your proposition, your main idea. You want it to be about four words long. Why? Because people can remember it better. So how many words do I have today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Absolute failure at this thing called preaching. I couldn't make it any shorter. Because this is really what I believe Paul is saying. God, help us experience. And that word there is experience is very intentional. Help us experience all you have for us in Christ. And we're going to go through, as we go through these things, because Paul's going to give us five things that he wants to experience, all th things that he wants us to know, and then five things that he wants us to appreciate. And so as we go through it, how are we going to do this? Well, here's Paul's first request. Lord, help us to know what you want for us. Help us to know what you want for us. If we go there in verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. That word there, knowledge, is like, the word is for, for which we get our word knowledge is from the Greek word gnosko, kind of sounds familiar a little bit. And then Paul adds a word on to there. He adds the word epi. It's like an, it's like a, 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 an introductory word, an introductory little proposition. Uh, whatever that would be, the first word. Whatever the first word is, I lost it. He adds the first little word onto there to make it even stronger. So he says, I don't want you just to know this. I want you to really know this, like super abundant know this, okay? And that word there for knowledge is really what we would get is knowledge by experience. Like I've said before, I remember when I did my very first funeral here at Frontline Bible Church. A man by the name of Lloyd Aronson. Dear, dear man. Very first funeral I ever had a chance to do as a pastor. And I remember doing his funeral, having never had anyone close to me die. Now, I had had others outside. I had been to a funeral here and there, but I had never had really anybody close to me die. And it wasn't too many years later that my grandma died. When my grandma died, I now had experienced what it was like to have somebody that you love, who's your family, laying in that casket. Let me tell you, my experience of preaching funerals was different after I saw my grandma there. I've never had a chance. I've never lost a parent. Praise God for that. Certainly never lost a child. But when you go through the death of someone, you experience it. People can tell you what it's like, but until you experience it, it's different. And the same thing is true for the Christian life. Until you experience some of these things, until you really know, until you yourself, you can hear me preach about it, which is why my prop this morning was so many words long. Help us experience individually, as a church, as believers in Jesus Christ. Help us experience all you have for us in Christ. And so Paul says, I want you to know some stuff. First of all, I want to, I want, I'm, I'm praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The first thing he wants us to know is God wants to fill you with knowledge. But knowledge, not just knowledge, knowledge of his will. And let me tell you, let me get you a little secret. Do you know what God's will is for you? Do you know what God's will is for you? Some of you are saying, hmm, what's he asking? Is he asking who I should marry? Is he asking what my next car should be? Where I should move? Where I should I where should I eat for lunch today? What's he saying? Okay, what's I mean, is is that the will that Paul's talking about? I don't, I don't think so. I think what Paul is saying is he's saying there is a will in place for each and every single one of us, and it is the exact same will. Did you know that? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. One of the most famous verses in the Bible is verse 828. 
So we'll just start there in verse 28, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Good comes out of bad, so why are you struggling so much? Why are you worrying? Good comes out of bad. Psh, psh, come on, you're just not trusting Jesus enough, right? Come on. That's oftentimes what happens, you know. Come on, you know, yeah, your loved one just died, but all things work together for good. It's used like this, uh, kind of drives me nuts, actually. Because ultimately it comes back to, the, the good comes when we understand what the purpose is. Why is it that bad can become good? It's because God has a purpose that He is working out. And He uses even bad things to bring about good, which is because He has a will for you and for me. It's the exact same thing, verse 829. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. What is God's will for your life and for mine? It is to make you and me just like Jesus. Therefore, God can use death, He can use famine, He can use trials, tribulations, good, bad. God can use anything because God's will is not your comfort. God's will is to make you just like Jesus. And so when Paul says back in here in, in, uh, in Colossians chapter 1, he says, I'm praying that God would fill you with the knowledge of His will. Through all, and, uh, through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The word there, wisdom, is the word meaning skill. Skill in living. So it's how do I live this life and how do I understand this life? Through all wisdom and understanding that God would fill you with the knowledge of His will. I pray, and that's my prayer for each and every single one of you. When I look around and I see some of the things that many of you go through, it breaks my heart. Especially when I hear about people who come down with cancer and stuff like this and I think God I wish you would take it away but that's when my little brain kicks in and I say God I pray that you will use whatever it is they're going through to make them just like Jesus no matter what and so when I hear difficulties when I hear of trials it is my prayer that God would open your eyes to say God no matter what I'm facing today no matter what it is I pray that you would use this to make me just like Jesus because that's what it matters. He goes on. And we pray this. In order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. And may please Him in every way. The, the second thing. He says, I want, I want, the first one. Fill you with knowledge. Second one. I want you to be pleasing to God. And may live a life worthy of the Lord. And may please Him in every way. Now how do you please God? How do you please God? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We're going to be talking about this a lot coming up. What I'm going to tell you the secret is, it's not what you think. It's not making sure you're in church every Sunday. But don't stop coming, okay? It's not making sure you're praying three, four, eight times a day. But don't stop praying, okay? It's not making sure you're reading your Bible morning and evening. But don't stop reading your Bible morning and evening. It's not those things that we think this is what we have to do. Interestingly enough, do you know what makes you pleasing to God? The fact that you are His child. I'll give you a little story. I read this, man, really struck me. Picture mom and dad, brand new baby. The baby just popped out. Dirty, got nastiness all over. You know what I'm talking about if you've been around that scene before. What does the baby do? Cries, right? Comes out and says, Mom, I am so thankful that you had me. That doesn't happen, really, does it? The baby cries and then it begins the next few months pooping, crying, crying some more, sleeping amazingly little, pooping, crying, this, this whole scene, right? And you say to the parent, parent, do you love that child? And the parent says, oh, I would do anything for that child. 
What did that child do for you? Poop, cry, keep you from sleeping, all these sort of things. And yet the parent is crazy about this child. Do you know what makes you pleasing to God? Because you are His child. That's what makes you pleasing. Paul says, I just wish you would know. I wish you would know that God is crazy about you and that as you live, you live a life in such a way that reflects the fact that God is crazy about you. That's what I hope you would know. And even when you struggle and even when you blow it, even when you think there's no way God could love me because I've cried too much, I've pooped too much, I've done all those sort of things. I know. Did I take the image too far? Maybe. When I think that all this sort of stuff makes me unlovable by God, that's when God says, man, I'm crazy about you. I really am. And I pray that you would live a life that reflects the fact that you know this. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. He also wants you to bear fruit in every good work. Once again, as we come back to this, God, He says, I'm, I'm coming into your life and you're going to come into mine. You see, this is oftentimes the missing piece. We think that God came into us and took up residence through the Holy Spirit. What we miss is the fact that God has placed us into Him. And once again, we're going to be talking this, about this a lot more in future weeks. So that's why you've got to keep coming. You can't stop this week, okay? You've got to keep coming back because there's things that you're going to learn and you're going to understand about this thing called the Christian life, which I hope is going to radically change it. Because as you begin to go through this, you're going to begin to say, okay, God, I want to bear good fruit for you. But then remember my original question, if only, I would, if, only, if only I were stronger, if only I had more willpower, if only I had this, then I could do it. Man, God, I want to bear good fruit for you. I want to be the best Sunday school teacher I could be. I want to be the best pastor I could be. I want to raise my kids the best that I could be. I want to do all these sort of things. And we think to ourselves, get to work, get to work, get to work. When in reality, it's like God is saying, hey, I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest and I'm your life and I want to give you the strength you need to be the Sunday school teacher that you want, me, that you want to be. I want to give you the strength that you need to be the best pastor, John, to be the best parent, to whatever it is. I want to give you that strength. But here's the deal. I'm giving you that as you trust in me. You can go off on your own and you can try it. But you're not going to work. It's not going to work because you are not enough. But I'm enough. And that's the thing. He says, I want you to know I want you to know what I have for you. Remember, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will. That knowledge is that who you are in Christ matters and what He has done for you matters. And it makes all the difference when it comes to this life. And when we live out of that relationship with Christ, when we live out of who Christ is in us, we will bear fruit in every good way. We will live a life that's worthy and pleasing of Him. And we also will grow in the knowledge of God. Being a part of Frontline for as long as what I have, it's crazy. I've been here, well, let's see, I think, oh yeah, I passed my anniversary. I'm in my 23rd year here now. Crazy. You've watched me grow up. <laughs> For those of you who've been around a while, still have a lot of growing up to do. I realize that. And I've watched a lot of you grow up too. Man, it's been fun for me to look out. Even just over the past couple of weeks when we were doing our community building time and we were having stories being shared. I can look, I look out here and it is truly the grace of God as I look around and see many faces right here in this room. Of those of you who have said, God, I'm willing to let you have your way in me. Oh my goodness, it's a joy to watch. It is a joy to watch. Unfortunately, there are others though who I've known maybe a long time. And it seems as if you're like on pause in your Christian life. It's like, it's like you hit the pause button and 20 years went by and we really haven't even changed in 20 years. You still struggle with the same worries and the same struggles and the same things. And God says, man, I got so much for you. I, I want you to experience 
the change that could happen in your life when you say, God, here I am. Take me. Make your life come out in me. Make me just like Jesus. Man, God, help us experience all you have for us in Christ Jesus. That last one there. Filled with knowledge, pleasing to God, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, the last one, strengthened with all power. As he says in verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. How many of you would like a little more patience today? Don't pray for it. Don't pray for patience, okay? You know why? Because God will test you. <laughs> he will bring you to the absolute end of yourself. He will bring you to that place where you say, God, I cannot go on anymore. And then he'll say, good, you finally learned. That's what patience does when you pray for it. It's terrible. But it's awesome at the same time. When you go through this, okay, so Paul, so Paul is here saying, okay, this is what I want you to know. I want you to know that you have access to the strength of the creator of the universe. How many of you struggle to get the lids off of pickle jars? And you're thinking, I struggle getting the lid off of a pickle jar. How in the world am I supposed to beat anger, lust, addiction, pride, whatever else? I feel powerless. And Paul says, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that based on who you are in Christ, you have access to the strength of God. Notice that. Being strengthened with all power according to His, not yours, according to His glorious might. As we live out of a relationship, as we live out of this, this identity as to who we are, we begin to realize we have strength to overcome things that we never thought we had possible. Why? Because in and of ourselves we were powerless. And then he says, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I feel like every day is a new day when it comes to the Christian life. I want consistency. I want more consistency in my life. I'm seeing it more than really what I ever have in my life, and it's awesome to see. But even I have struggled certain days. And that's why Paul says, I want you to go back and I want you to hear this. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would experience all that God has for you in Christ Jesus. I pray, God, help each and every single one of these people who are reading this to know what God has done for us, what He wants for us in our life. Help them to know. Because I think if we really understood, man, God, you want to give this to us. You want this in our life. Man, what a difference it could be. He goes on. Not just help us to know what you want for us. Help us to appreciate all you've done for us. Help us to appreciate all you've done for us. Joyfully and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life, in the kingdom of light. When we come to our first point here, what has God done for us? He's already done some things for us. The first thing He did was He qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now what does that even mean? Does that mean that I got my mansion waiting for me in heaven someday? Is that what it is? Part of it. Whether it's a mansion or not, we don't know. It's the word for like a house. But God, does God have something waiting for me in, in heaven someday? Absolutely. But you know what he, was also another part of the inheritance? Another part of this inheritance is resurrection life. It's resurrection power. It's the same power that's in Christ gets worked out in my own life. That's the inheritance that I get. As a child of God, as a son of God who is placed in Christ, Christ in me, I'm in Christ. He says, let me live my life through you. So the inheritance that I get is I get God's strength to live in this life. And that turns out into things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness, self-control, all these things. Those all get worked out in my life 
when Christ lives his life in me. The thing is, I've already been given the inheritance. We're going to keep going on through this. We're going to see. Hopefully, maybe as you identify this, maybe you're going to realize, how many of you are still praying you get these things? Somebody said one time, how cruel would it be to tell somebody to come into a room that they're already in? And then just to keep reminding them, you need to be in here. You need to get into this room. But I'm already here. You need to be in here. Are you going crazy? I'm already in the room. You need to be in this room. You need to be in here. Try to get in here. Okay, all right, I'll try to get in, but I'm already in. I don't even know how I'm supposed to... What do I do? Go back out and come back in again? And yet there are Christians, which sounds crazy, right? And yet there are Christians, just like you, just like me, who live our life trying to get things that God's saying you already got. You already have the inheritance. That's what he said. You already have the inheritance. You already have the Holy Spirit. You already have all these things. He goes on. Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. So, he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. Now, what is this dominion of darkness? What is this dominion of darkness? When I look at it, when I see this whole thing, so often when I think of darkness, I think of bad things, right? I think of bad things like murder, like, you know, rape. I think of really bad stuff, you know, and, and even the stuff that's not quite as bad in our eyes, lying, you know, things like that, cheating on something. That's what I tend to think. You know, so how does the devil do his work? What is the dominion of darkness? Really, what we think is that it's in all the bad stuff in life. So as long as we focus on the good stuff in life, then we can be doing the things that need to be done, right? Stay away from the bad, focus on the good, and we're good. Here's what I want you to see. Sometimes good things can get in the way of God. Right? Have you ever had that be happen before? You see, that's what was going on here in Colossae. That's what was, that's what was going on in the church. The thing was, the, the, the devil had done his work, and he had get, got in there, and he was mixing them all up, and he was telling them that in order to be really acceptable to God, you need to do certain feast days, you need to go through these ceremonial things like circumcision, like all this sort of stuff. You need to say no to this and you need to beat your body. You need to, it was called asceticism. And asceticism is where you make things bad in your body, like you diet, things like that. That's kind of what it is, okay? It's like dieting. You say, okay, I'm going to punish my body because I know that I shouldn't be doing, I need to be doing this, so I'm going to punish it over here. And that's what was happening, asceticism. And so all this sort of stuff, the people were saying, if I want to be like God, then I need to do this, and I need to do this. And the devil's over there going, yes, yes. I don't care if you're not doing bad stuff. Focus on all this good stuff, because at the end of the day, you're going to get frustrated with this too. You're going to be trying to get close to God by trying harder and trying harder and trying harder. And at the end of the day, you know what you're going to do to the Christian life? You're going to say, done work for me. How many of you have ever felt that way? I tried. I've done all the right things. I've prayed. I've read scripture. I've done all this sort of stuff. I've even started going to church. And I go through all this, and at the end of the day, man, I still feel like I'm not very close to God. And the devil says, yes. You see, the devil doesn't just operate in the darkness like this. It says the devil masquerades as an angel of light. He does it. And so when you look at your life, when you look at what's going on, what, when I think of what we're supposed to do as Christians, 
I need to understand that he's already rescued me from this. And we're going to, once again, we're going to be talking about this more in, in future weeks. So if it doesn't make a lot of sense now, it's coming, okay? Because he rescued me out of this. He says, you no longer need to be in this world anymore. I want to bring you out of this, and I want you to live in, this, in, in, this, in the light that's here in verse 13. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He's brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. And it's within this kingdom, it's within this rule and reign of God, that God says you have access to things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. We have access to the, to the creator of the universe and all of his power. We have access to that. And then he goes on, he says, and in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption is literally the word to be set free. To set us free. It's like God came along and he said, you're slaved. You're enslaved to sin and all this other sort of stuff. He says, I want to take you out of this. I don't want you to feel like you have to serve this master anymore. I am setting you free for God over here. And then he says, I've given you forgiveness of sins as well. Man, what a joy it is. God doesn't just sentimentally forgive sins. Here's something to remember. Oftentimes we look in the world and we talk to people who don't know much about the Bible. And they say, well, you know, God's a loving God. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which road you choose. They all road lead to heaven anyway. And the answer is no. It's no. If, if all roads led to heaven, why would Jesus have needed to come and die anyway? Why? You see, Jesus had to come and die because we were dead in our sins and dead in our trespasses and sins. And so Jesus came and he, he paid a price. And he gave his life, which offered redemption. He set us free, and the blood that was shed gave us forgiveness of sins. It cost Jesus everything to be able to set us free. And so often when I talk to people, I, I hear people, Oh boy, I hope God forgives me for this. I hope God forgives me for that. God, please forgive me. But you're already in the room. You're already forgiven. You don't need to keep trying to get back into the room that you're already in. I remember talking to a guy. He ended up, he divorced his wife. He got frustrated. He was angry with her, all this sort of stuff. And he divorced his wife. But he was a deacon in his church. He was a deacon in his church. And he said, if she would have divorced me, God could have forgiven that. He can't forgive me now. How sad. This man lived with the guilt and the shame. Did what he did was wrong, absolutely. But when he did this, he lived with the shame and he believed that he could never get into the room that he was already in. And as a result, he lived this withered life. To my knowledge, he still is living that way. Help us appreciate, God, all that you've done for us already. You see, as we go through this, as we read this section, it's like Paul's praying, God, God, I care so much about these people. And I can say the same thing. I care so much about each and every single one of you. People have invested in me. And I tell you, my understanding of the Christian life is light years beyond what it was. Light years, even after Bible college. My understanding of the grace of God, my understanding of the mercy of God, my understanding of who Christ is and the role of the Holy Spirit in our life, all these sort of things have come and it's really opened up my eyes to an awful lot of things. And I have the absolute privilege of being able to tell you about it. But my hope and my prayer for every single one of you is that your eyes get opened up. But here's the thing. Unless God opens your eyes, I can't do it. Their words. I can tell, try to tell the best stories. I can try to use the best analogies. But until God opens your eyes, I can't do it. And so, here's the deal. For the homework today, as we wrap it up, the homework is this. I hope that you pray. God, help me know and appreciate what you have done for me in Christ. I hope that's what it is. I hope that as you, as you say this prayer, that, that the, the Holy Spirit actually gets in there and does His work. And He opens up those places in your heart and you begin to see and realize we serve an amazing God. And I hope that you keep coming back, 
Not just because I like you here, which I do like you here. But I really want you to understand who Jesus is and just how much he can set you free from this rat race called the Christian life. And how he can set you on a path to true freedom, true fulfillment, true life. Christ, our life. And so as we wrap it up this morning, let's just pray and ask God to do that. God, as I think about your word, as I think about this passage, Lord, we can see Paul's heart. He just truly wanted these people to experience you. He wanted these individuals to know you, and not just know you mentally, but truly know you in their heart. And so, God, I just ask that you will take um, these truths and the things that we talked about, and just in some way, God, open our eyes, including my own. May I take something more even from what this is. But for all of us here, God, we want to know you better. Not just so that we can get through life, but so that we can truly evidence life, Christ, our life. So thank you um, for what you're going to do. We look forward to seeing it in Jesus' name. And all those in agreement said, amen.